Who is that by Panasonic or? Olympus. Olympus. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's beautiful. All right. They got some new stuff. Yeah, so I'm going to set it right here. Okay. Okay. Um, my name is Barbara Blake, and it's December 15th, 2009. And I'm sitting here at NOAA and on Pivers Island talking to Mr. Bobby Chambers. Right. Okay, Bobby. Okay. <laughs> um, to start off, can you just tell me a little bit about your background when you were born and where you grew up? Well, basically, I'm born right here in Moorhead and grew up here pretty much all my life, so. Uh, okay, what year were you born? 1957. 1957? Yes. All right, so you grew up, were there still factories in Moorhead? Uh, pretty much. I remember the guys used to go fishing the season in and out. They were always, it's the fishing season for us. Guys would go away from the community and they would always come back every six months as a little boy, remember these things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, pretty much. Now, how did you first get involved in the industry? Uh, like I said, my oldest brother, Richard Chambers, uh, he went fishing. I think his, he was at the age of 20, and I never forgot that. And um, as the years passed and he became a captain, he hired me. So I got a chance to go down and uh, start fishing. How old were you? I was 23 years old. Oh, okay. 23. And so, where did you fish out of? Well, we started fishing right in a uh, town they called Moss Point for a company of standard products. Moss Point, Mississippi. Right. And uh, like I said, we worked for the company Standard Products. I worked with Standard, um, for, I think, for around about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then they changed to another uh, company by Omega Protein. And I think they lasted like a couple of years. And by command, Sapata Haney, uh, I think, hired a few boats from Omega, and it was happened to be one of our boats. And so by chance, we kept a job because um, a lot of boats didn't get a chance to go back out because I guess the company kind of failed, and it was just a few boats they hired, and we got a chance to go over to another company, Sapata Haney, which was pretty much next door. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, your brother was older than you, right? Oh, yes. Yes. How do you think he first got involved in the industry? Like I said, from all the older fishermen from years back, from the community. Mm -hmm. uh, guys would go away and come back, and I guess as a young boy, you know, he, young man or whatever, he got a chance to go down and start fishing. So it, it, it starts from, like, generation on generation, you know, so. Did your um, father or grandfather fish? None at all. Mm -hmm. None at all. I guess it's just my brother just was hired by one of the older fishermen, and, uh, that's how he started from, you know. And so did he work his way up the ranks? Yes, he started uh, just like uh, he would always say, right in the purse boats, and uh, he worked up from uh, working in the purse boats up to being an uh, engineer. He, I think he was an engineer for probably about six or seven years, and then as he progressed, he worked his way up captain, just learning, hmm. you know, taking notes and... Uh, and he just uh, made it to a captain again. So, I mean, it, it's, it's, I'm proud of him. It really is from the, the knowledge that he had and experience and the things that he told me and uh, from learning and sticking with the hard work and not really giving up. And uh, he really accomplished a lot. He really did. And what what was the name of the boat that he was captain of? Oh, wow. He was captain of a lot of boats, but his first boat was the Lois K. And this was in um, 1979. The Lawrence K? The Lois, L-O-I-S. Oh, the Lois K. Lois K. Oh, it was you. a real small boat. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was his first boat in 79. And the next year, 1980, I went down. Mm -hmm. And then he got another boat, which was the Tiger Shark. Mm -hmm. And we fished on the Tiger Shark for about, I think, about four or five years. And we went to another boat called the Lord's Sea. And uh, as years passed, two or three years, we went to another boat and different boats. So he fished probably about, I guess, about nine, ten boats. Wow. Different boats. Yeah. Yes. So was it... Unusual for a, a black man to reach the position of captain, or was that pretty typical down there? To me, 
from what my brother was uh, had told me, it, it was it was a position that most of the captains were white, and uh, you know, like I say, looking from where how he started and what he accomplished, uh, it wasn't easy from where he was taught the hardship and the. Uh, really sticking to it to get that position because most of 90 percent of fishermen are black guys and uh, I mean it was a few white guys but most of the white guys were maybe the engineers and the captains mm -hmm. but like I said 90 percent of fishermen were black guys you know mm -hmm. and so yeah so that was really something yeah it, it really was I've experienced a lot I liked it I met a lot of guys I've met a lot of older men and, my, and I'm pretty sure most of these guys are probably gone, probably dead. And if not dead, you know, I'm hopefully they're around, but quite naturally, I think a lot of these guys have passed away. Mm -hmm. And it was really like family because you didn't get to see these guys only from one season to the next, from six months to the next six months. So like I said, we were leaving April and fish to October, and it was like a year-round thing. And most of the time, you didn't see these guys until you went back in six months. And when you seen these guys, it was good to see them because it was pretty much the same guys every year. Every now and then, you'll have a new guy. But it was like family because really your life was kind of like depending on this guy in a sense if something happened and you felt bonded with these guys. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, like I said, I met a lot of guys. I was told a lot of things by the older fishermen that experienced fishing back in the when they had the wooden boats and when they had to pull the nets by hand and salt the nets with salt and the things that they told me, it was really mind-blowing mm -hmm. compared to the, uh, the fishing. When I had started, it was more modern, but it was hard work. Mm -hmm. It was really, really hard work. But I, looking back over, I really appreciate every day of it. I've seen a lot of stuff and been in places for as waters and areas that I never forget and some things you cannot always record down or write down but in your mind you never forget these things and I really got this saw and seeing a beautiful stuff uh, for us on the water that God had created you know just seeing the, the the areas of fish and just different things yeah what were some of the amazing things that you saw out there fishing especially when you would see the schools of Manhattan's at one time. I mean, it's, it's, it's something to see that many schools of fish, um, how they were, I guess, from growth from, from the time, from six months, from one season to the next. And But like I say, just to see that many fish at one time, is, it was mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. It really was. It's, uh, I, I can't describe it, but, you know, like I said, you got to saw a lot of other stuff that were also feeding on the fish for it. Sharks and um, um, rays and all different other kind of fish, even the pelicans. We saw some beautiful, um, um, I, I forget the name of those birds, but uh, like I said, a lot of stuff I've seen I won't forget. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've been in some areas like, um, it's an area I'll never forget we call Tiger Pass, going through in Louisiana through the bayous to get over on the other side and uh, seeing places where um, people were living that you wouldn't think that they were living, you know, just as far as going through the bayous. And like I said, I got to saw a lot of stuff on the waters and stuff and met a lot of guys, different guys. That was Cajun country, wasn't it? Yeah, pretty much, so pretty much. I know it was Cajun country because, like I said, to leave from, the, uh, from Mississippi side to get over on the Louisiana side, we had to travel pretty much a long way. Because we had to go where the fish was. Because most of the time, if the fish didn't show where you was at, you had to go where they were at. So uh, it's like we leave from one area and go to another area. Even mm -hmm. times we went down to um, Florida, places like uh, I, this town was like Apalachicola, Florida. It was beautiful just to travel those many hours just to go and make a payday. But it was worth it. You know, it really was it. Cause that's how we had to make money. Yeah, we couldn't so just stay to the diet. You know? And you'd see all these different villages. Right. The way people live. And not only that, you would see other boats, even though you didn't get to meet these guys, but you, they were doing the same thing that you were doing. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes it would be sometimes 30, 40 boats in an area where there was fish safe. So, it was, it, yeah, that was it. It was mind-blowing just to see. And sometimes you would probably know somebody that was on a boat, but 
you could do nothing but wave. You know, say, like one of my friends over there. So it was just a good feeling to see one of maybe somebody from your hometown on a boat, but all you can do is just wave and keep on going. So, yeah. so it, it was pretty good. So on your brother's boat, was the whole crew from here? Pretty much on, uh, they were mostly from North Carolina because I think out of them, uh, on our crew, it was probably two or three guys that were from Mississippi, but most of the guys were from North Carolina, places like Bell Haven, uh, from Beaufort, and and pretty much like North River, just the community around here. So it was mostly the guys from around the same area okay. in North Carolina. So. So you'd be down there six months? Yes. Where did you stay? Pretty much right on the boat because the boat was like our home for six months. Uh, it was the living quarters. You know, we had our, our beds to sleep in and we had the food. And, I mean, it was just like a home. But on the weekends, we could go pretty much anywhere we wanted. But on Sunday nights, we just had to be right on the boat when it was time to leave. Okay. So pretty much my boat was my home for six months. Yeah, so Saturday night, if you, there wasn't anything to do, you could still stay on that boat? Pretty much, yes. You can just stay right where you're. Like I say, it was like a home for me for six months, a home away from home. Yeah. That's how I would say it. So. And would the cook stay on there, too, and cook for yeah, you on the weekends? Pretty much on the weekends, you were on your own. Yeah. Because the cook, he had to go home to right. his family or something like that. So, but like I say, it was a home away from them, so it's just like a house. Uh -huh. But uh, you just had it managed until uh, Monday, just like a job uh, would start Monday. Then the cooks would come in and even start his day. So, but um, it was it was good. So, Bobby, when you first started, what was your position with your brother? My first position, like I said, I started as a ring setter, and uh, and being honest, pretty much the whole years that I fished, that was pretty much my job. You were once you were hired to do a certain job, that was pretty much your position. Okay, could Even, you could you tell me about that? A ring setter is pretty much uh, is consistent of a bunch of rings that is hooked to the net. That when the net will go around the fish, the rings will cause the net to close down to the bottom. So as when the net is being pressed back in, each ring had to be put back on a like a bar. So um, you just had to just say they would come in. You would just pretty much put them back in and just um, keep them going. And it was pretty much the same old thing over over. Every set was pretty much the same routine, even though it turned out different. Sometimes we might have a bad set or the net might get torn up or something might not go right, but pretty much your job was pretty much the same thing over and over. So it wasn't hard to really catch on, but you just had to uh, stay focused and mostly keep an eye out on things because really it's a really dangerous job. You know, you had to keep your mind set on your job. So everybody's position was kind of dependent on everybody else's. You know, everything had to be kind of like on cue, mm -hmm. you know, so... Even though you wind up doing different other things, because that's what fishing was. It was like a team. Mm -hmm. Everybody worked it together, and sometimes you would switch up doing this man's job or he would do yours. But everybody worked it together because fishing is required everybody working together. Okay, and so what were some of the other jobs in the purse boats? Uh, what we call a web and spreader. The man would spread the net around in the purse boat as it comes back in to keep it even. A cork puller. This man would pull the corks in as they would come in. That was, that was really, I think, pretty much the toughest job in it because he had to keep, in order to keep the corks up, the man had to pull them. And if he didn't pull them right, the fish would go over the corks and you were losing fish. So oh. it was, you know, it was pretty much something. But like I say, over and over, everybody had a job to do and. Uh, Everybody had to count on each other doing it, and it was this other job um, where the guys were dropped the tongue. That was pretty much kind of dangerous because you had to be over this body's tongue, probably weighing probably 500 pounds, and you had to, you got all these ropes around you, and you had to know how to put a certain rope in there, and uh, once you put it in there, the captain would do the rest. He would drop the tongue over. That would cause the net to close at the bottom, so... I like say over and all this job was it was a job. It was a man's job, believe me. You learned a lot and uh um you appreciated every every 
Every day of it, believe me, after a day's work, it was hard because you had to get right back up from sun up to sun down. As long as the sun was up and if the plane spotted, could spot fish, you would fish. But after the day is over, you had to get ready for pretty much the next day because the next day would start real early. Mm -hmm. Real early because as the summer coming was coming in, the hotter it got, the more the fish showed up. So, oh. you know, you had to kind of get ready for that. And it would get, the temperatures were getting kind of high. That I bet down there. Yes. <laughs> it's very hot down in the south. Did very. you wear a hard hat? Well, at the, being honest, at the beginning of fishing, it really, really wasn't required. But as things got more progressive as far as uh, safety, they required you to wear these things because a lot of guys were getting hurt mm -hmm. and different things. Even um, it was just protection, making sure that you were being, you know, for safety. And they tried every uh, um Thing that they could to keep a man being safe, even down to uh, wearing a, a vest or something like that in case a man fell overboard and stuff like that. So, but it wasn't really required, you know. Did anything ever happen while you were fishing? Uh, I, I've seen some guys got hurt, even myself, uh, you know, I, but uh, I've experienced, I've heard a lot of guys getting drowned, mm -hmm. but it's... Uh, it was one guy that got drowned in our company, but he was on another boat. So I thought all the years fishing, that was really pretty much the rough, roughest year because this guy had worked with us before. Mm -hmm. But it just fortunately, he went over to another boat the next year, and uh, he was from Bellhaven, North Carolina. And uh, he got missing that day, and it really took a lot out of you. Here you trying to work, knowing this guy is overboard, and they looking for him, but we had to kindly work, and then sometimes we would stop and try to, you know, look for him. But, uh, yeah, like I said, emotionally it took a lot out of you, and uh, they found the guy the next day. Did they? Yeah, but pretty much he had drowned it. But, uh, like I say, you know, it takes a lot of you when you lose a friend. Yeah, he or, had just know. fallen overboard while they were underway? Or? Yeah, well, they were going on... Uh, a set themselves, and I think, for as I know, the boats kind of flipped over, and it just fortunately, you know, he was thrown overboard, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it's things happen so quick. So, but like I say, you know, out of all the times that I fished, that was pretty much a rough year. Did you ever get caught in bad weather? Yes, I mean, it seems time. It's funny how the weather changed. It can be. I mean, beautiful out there. The water could be so calm, and then all of a sudden, it can just, a storm will come up from out of nowhere. And I've got a chance of uh, seeing some really rough weather, what we would um, call gripes. We would call gripe the boats in, tighten the boats up for our security. And our brother would tell us, well, the captain would tell us, you know, buckle down or tighten everything down because they, the most important thing about fishing was keeping up with the weather because, mm -hmm. you know, that played a very more, uh, important part of fishing. You say gripes, like G-R-I-P-E? Gripes, G-R-I, yes, G-R-I-P-E-S. Uh -huh. like, they're like cables. Oh, they like secure the boat. And, right. the they, first Right, boats. and they secure the boats. Anything to keep anything from moving. Because mm -hmm. when we did those things, we knew it was rough weather coming. And most of the time, we either would go closer in shore and drop anchor than to just stay out in the middle of the water. Because the closer you got in shore, the less the boat would rock and, you know, you were more secure. But most of the time, we would go close in shore when bad weather came in. or go to, If we can make it to a dock or somewhere where, where port was or to a another to um to the plant but if we couldn't make it there we just had to stay out there and uh anchor down mm -hmm. wow did you ever fear for your life out there plenty of times <laughs> because like i say most of the time when you fear for your life is when the boats were loaded with fish and then you had to uh travel a long way getting back to the plant and uh, you never know what can happen especially during the night you're traveling mm -hmm. but you know you were like um the captain, he had to bring us in, and he had uh, he had a real hard job on him, making sure that uh, everybody got in safe. And uh, you know, I can just picture him uh, 
sitting up all night and making sure he's going the right direction, especially steering late at night in the dark. But, uh, yeah, you know, your life was really looking over it. Uh, your life was, you were always, I guess, your life was just always kind of, um, it could have been lost really either way because we've experienced some rough times at that times, you know, so you never know what can happen for us accidents. And I stuff. bet there are some times where fishermen are praying mighty hard. Right. Yeah, and at times you would because, especially when the weather would be breaking and all of a sudden the boat's just going all kinds of ways and the weather's rough and really it will it'll kind of keep you up. It would really keep you, you know, everybody had to put on their life jackets. And uh, I seen the time that we all went up in the pile house. That's how really rough it was, uh, especially right uh, by the lighthouse over here going towards Virginia one day. And the weather got real rough, and uh, it was so rough that we almost, um, pretty much we was on our way into Bofa, but we had, it was so rough that we couldn't make it in. We had to go all the way back to to the town Reesville, Virginia, because the weather was so rough that we could not get, make it in. Oh, my goodness. And that's how rough it was. So, like you said, you're going to see some bad times like that sometimes. So, the whole crew crowded into the pilot house? Yes, because uh, that's how rough it was. And you were in, like, 20-foot seas, you know. And, you know, like I said, just to see those seas that high, it, it, it's unbelievable. Nobody wanted to be down there. No. <laughs> Because, you know, down below it was kind of uncomfortable, so you felt pretty more secured up, kind of upstairs in a way, yeah. especially when you're around everybody and yeah. stuff. Yeah. Was your brother captain of that boat? That yes. Day? So you didn't only fish down to the Gulf? No, I fished in, uh, like I said, we went to Reedsville, Virginia plenty of times, mostly in the winter time. We would come back and do fall fishing. Would you run that boat all the way up here, or would you get on a boat that was already here? Yeah, most time we would leave from Beaufort, or like I said, most time we would fish right out the area out here, and if not, we would go where the fish was, and like I said, sometimes we had to go all the way down to uh, to the Virginia and fish, you know, we had to go where the fish was at. And so. were you still working for Standard Products? Yeah, well, we were working for... Uh, Support a Haney then at the time okay. because, like I say, um, it was only a few boats that would leave from Mississippi and would come down here and fish and then go back. So, so that was a long run for the season to carry one of those boats from Mississippi all the way up here. Yeah, well, most time, well, the season wouldn't start in the winter time, would wouldn't start until about the, um, in November. You know, so my brother would bring the boat from Mississippi and park it here in a Beaufort plant, and then the crew would meet him here, and then we would start from here and pretty much and just go out out on the waters and fish and work our way down from Virginia back and forth. Doing the same thing like we're doing this summer, but it was just a lot different. We were working in deeper waters, and the areas were different and stuff like that, so... And, and rougher weather since it was November. Yeah, pretty much. The weather is a lot more rougher down on this end than it is in the state of Mississippi, you know, because, like I said, it was one a time. And plus, uh, everything is different. Everything is different for us. Um, the fish are bigger, and you're just in different different areas and stuff like that. So, What was it like around here in November and December with all these boats fishing out of here? You know, matter of fact, I, I miss it. It was pretty neat because, you know, like I say, it was a fishing is, is a thing that was going on since I was little. And when you get to see all these guys and being a part of it and seeing all these boats parked downtown and you don't see this stuff no more, time has changed. And matter of fact, I was riding yes a couple of days ago and I was looking how, and I was reminded all those boats used to be parked downtown, and even the plant is no longer there no more. And I can just stand out there sometime and just look at the waters. We come through there many a days just to go unload and go right back out. But time has changed a lot now, and a lot of those stuff is pretty much going away. You know, and like I say, um, a lot of guys that I met, and you know, I think about those guys, and but. You know, nothing stays the same. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing stays the same. So, change is going to come. But I, 
one thing about fishing, I'll never forget it. I really enjoyed it. I really did. And why did you get off the boat? But unfortunately, I got hurt. Oh, you did? Yes. How'd you get hurt? Uh, I had an injury, and I had an injury in 99, so that stopped me from being able to fish because if I, I'm sure if I hadn't got hurt, I would have be fishing right now. I know I would have. So unfortunately, I just had a bad accident. Yeah. So, but you've got this job with Noah now. Yes, it's just something to do. To, you know, I've always liked to work, but uh, it's just something just to stay busy. Yeah. It's not close to, you know, far as fishing, but I just like to stay busy and was, work. Was the money better fishing? Of course. Yes, the money's definitely better, but like I say, guys, you know, really went fishing to provide for their families. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, and I know that's why they went away for six months. The hardest thing was about fishing was leaving your family. Even out of the 17, well, the whole years I've been fishing, I never got used to leaving my family because after six months, you come home for six months, and it seemed like the time would go by so fast, then all of a sudden you had to leave again. And... uh to leave your family was, it was pretty much a hard thing. And I'm pretty sure all the other guys felt the same way, but we had to go away to make a living. We had to go away, provide. And, uh, I, and I did it, and, I, and I'm glad for that. Yeah. And I look back over, I wouldn't change it for anything if I had to do it all over again. How many kids did you have, Bobby? I have two. Oh, that's nice. Two kids, and they're, they're pretty much, my daughter's graduated from college, my son is getting out of high school, so they 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 understand now. I'm pretty sure they can look back over it now and say, well, Daddy did what he did to take care of us. So, you know, because uh, I used to hate to see them cry when I would leave, you know. Yes. But they understand now, you know, yeah. they understand. So I can look back over it a lot. Really, it's like I'm falling. Uh, I look at my brother when he was... Uh, time that he went fishing and I was a little boy and how he had to go away and provide for his family. And uh, and I'm ne I never forget that day, it seemed like it, but it's like you're falling in guys' footsteps. A lot of these guys, I'm, like I said, over, are dead and gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, But um, they took care of their families. And being honest with you, fishing, it didn't really require uh, like uh, a lot of education, so to speak. All it was required is you're willing to work. And, and and that's all it took. You know, I, a lot of guys, I'm being honest, the guys that I worked with and that I met, they were, they were nice guys. They were real good guys. You met some guys every now and then that were different, but that's life. Everybody's different. Mm -hmm. Everybody's different, but... Uh, so you can, some guys, some older people can really teach you some stuff, mm -hmm. especially from what they experienced and uh, the things that they went through way before I even thought about getting on a fishing boat. But uh, I, like I say over and over, I'll never forget the stories that they told me and stuff, the hardship that they went through before we got to really what I call modern fishing, you know, but... Uh, they modern fishing? Modern, as far as up to... The, the equipment, we had better equipment. The a work modern was, fishing, I right. got you, yeah. And see, back then, when them guys had to pull by hand, I can imagine, I know that was hard work. It was hard when we did it, so. But to sit back and hear those guys and say what they did, and then after the night, you pretty much forgot about the hard day. Everybody would probably play cards or sit around and eat fish or talk fishing stories or tell a few stories. That wasn't true, you know, but <laughs> it was all fun. Mm -hmm. It was all fun. And then at the end of the season, it was pretty much like you hated to leave because, you know, the guys would go their direction, you would go yours, and, you know, just hoping that you would see these guys next year because, you never know, sometimes we come back, one guy might not have come back or might have passed away or just something different, might have went on another boat or something, but... You looked at pretty much forward for another season. Mm -hmm. You know, you did because, like you say, uh, it was time to start all over. The money was kind of getting low again, so <laughs> it was that time of the year to go back anyway. Right. So your brother, when he passed away, was he still working? 
Yes, matter of fact, he uh, passed away July the 8th of 2005. Matter of fact, he had a heart attack working on the boat. Well, I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, things happen, but uh, he, he was on the boat at the time that he had a heart attack. Mm. So. And so then the crew called the Coast Guard and... As far as I know of all of we just got a phone call that my brother had a heart attack, and uh, I don't really know a lot about it, but I do know he was doing what he loved to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just unfortunate, like I said again, that um, he just had a heart attack, you know. Yeah. And is he buried here or down No, there? he's buried in Moss Point, Mississippi. Mm-hmm. Like I said, he made it his home there. So um, that's pretty much it. I mean, you know. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, Bobby, is there anything else you'd like to add about about your your experience out on those fish boats? Yeah, well, I can say this one more. I say it over. It's really honoring my brother because I wouldn't have never experienced fishing without him. But the way my brother was, he treated everybody the same. He wanted everybody to learn something on the boat. He said, don't just come up here and do one job. He said... Start from the bottom up and work your way up to the captain. Because he really knew the more you knew on the boat, the more money you can make, even, you know, as far as engineering or whatever. But he gave everybody a chance to, to do something. When the times that he couldn't really do it all because at certain times, really blacks weren't allowed to do certain things, weren't allowed to come up in the pot houses from the stories that he had told me. But uh, he wasn't like that. You know, once he got to his position and he told us how things were, he let everybody come up, even if you wanted to steer the boat or want to do this. He said, because the only way you know these things, you have to learn or just try a little bit. And I really appreciate him. He was a hard worker. After all, out of all of the captains that I missed and that I worked with, I would really say my brother, he became top captain in 1980. Six, I believe, and that was the proudest season for me because I always wanted to see my brother be a, the top captain one year. He would fall short and fall short, and when he made it, he didn't really, I'm pretty sure he went to himself and he probably felt good, but he didn't really make a lot of noise about it. He just, he was real quiet about it, but I was really proud of him. I really was to be able to be a, a, a captain, not only being a captain, but being a black captain and being top boat in Moss Point, Mississippi. So that really said a lot. It really did because, like I said, in order to be the top captain, uh, long story short, I, it, it, you got to put out a lot of work. It didn't come easy. It didn't, and you had to stay with him. That's the way my brother was. He didn't give up. He uh, made a way out of no way, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And he said, even when you walked on the boat, he didn't show favoritism, not even to me. And I didn't want it. I came to work, and that's the way he was. And that's how it is. When you step on a fishing boat, you come to work. It wasn't any play in it. It wasn't, you know, your fun came on the weekends. But your work was on, on the boat. And when that boat left the dock from Monday to Friday, it was all about work. So to this day, I really appreciate it. Um, I know my brother's resting, but to me, like I say, uh, I was, you know, he was around, but that's, that's how life is. Mm-hmm. And, but, um, and good captains kept a good crew, didn't they? Right. Good captain kept a good crew. If you were on a good boat where you caught fish, you put them, that's the boat the guys want to be on. They didn't want to be on a boat where they want cats and fish. I mean, every boat is going to have their season. And some, even some good captains don't have good season, but most of the good captains, they pretty much caught good fish every year, and that's the boat said, I want to be on that. Mm-hmm. I want to be on But my brother, he hung in there. Mm-hmm. Believe me, out of all the years, he was a good captain, and uh, a lot of guys wanted to fish for him, but uh, overall, he really, he, he paid off. He paid off doing what he's what he done. Do you, did, do you remember who the cook was on your boat? Yeah, we met. A, I had a lot of cooks. Being honest, I was a cook myself at one season. You were? Yes, I tried it, but I preferred working in the uh, in the boats because it was, to me, it was 
you got to do a lot of other things than just cooking all day. What kind of food do they serve up on a shad boat? Pretty much on a fish uh, on boat, you can eat anything you want because, like I say, it was a home away from home. Anything that you wanted, we had it on the fish boat. Anything. The mobility, the most important thing on a boat for us uh, after hard day's work is that you had a good cook that can provide food, not to just throw anything together because it was hard work and you need to really to eat. You know what I'm saying? Then just somebody just got a job just cooking, but. A cook was really important on the boat. He really was. And the guys wanted a good cook. So some of the guys didn't have good cooks, but they were fortunate. We were fortunate to have good cooks. So, What were some of your favorite meals on a, on a fish boat? Oh, wow. Chicken, I guess, you know. <laughs> fish, but being honest, the guys love fish. They love to eat fish at night, two or three times a day. and But most of all, you know, the seafood just came pretty much plentiful because you can get it right off the water. You know, you right. catch your fish or some shrimp or crabs, and you didn't really have to worry about anything. It was good living. So you could, like, call out the mackerel from the menhaden. Right. And the cook would cook it. Yeah, you can cook it, and most of the guys would cook it for themselves because that part of the night, the cook job was pretty much over with because he had to get up early in the morning, and he was done. But the guys would do their own cooking. Like I said, we'd sit around and play cards and do other things because, like I said, the next day came pretty much early. Did anybody play music on the boat, bring instruments? Uh, not, well, every now and then you might see a guy that would probably play a guitar, but most of the times, you know, the guys had their own, you know, recorders or something like that. So, oh, I gotcha. Yeah. Did you guys have any white guys on your crew? Yeah, most of, like I said, we will have... Most of the white guys really were, like I said, the engineers and the pilots. And we would have one every now and then in the first boats, but like I said, 90% of, of fishing is black guys. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier that there was a time when, you know, like blacks weren't up, allowed up in the pilot house. Right. And weren't there separate bunk rooms and such? Or? Yeah, pretty much. It, the, most of the guys would sleep downstairs, and upstairs would be the captain and the pilot. And they pretty much shared the room together, even though they had, you know, them from beds. And then it was be like the mate and um, and the cook had their room together. And the two engineers had their rooms together. And then the other remaining guys, we would be down in the floor pit. So it pretty much, that's how it was. Everybody was kind of pretty much separated. Yeah, you know? how about the galley where you're eating? Oh, the galley... Some of the boats, been honest, were, were real nice boats, and some of them weren't. It all depends on how you kept your your boat up, because like I said, it was a home away from home. Mm -hmm. You want to keep it up just neat, just like you would do your home. What was your favorite boat? Oh, wow. Being honest with you, my brother had a boat, the Atlantic Shore from out of Virginia, and that was a really big boat, because my he left from like a small boat to a great big boat, and... Uh, out of all the boats, I really liked the Atlantic Shore because that was pretty much the fastest boat down there, and it held a lot of fish. But being honest, out of all of them, the first boat I ever walked on was the Tiger Shark. And like I say, uh, I got a picture of that boat, but uh, I, I, I was proud of my brother because I knew that was his second boat for being a captain and this to walk on the Tiger Shark, i never forget that. That was my first boat in 1980. So, mm -hmm. you know, you want to remember the first boat you ever worked on. So I, I'll say the Tiger Shark. Okay. Do you have any uh, photographs of your brother on the boat fishing? Uh, I really don't, but I'm pretty sure his wife and stuff does. But like I said, I, a lot of things we kind of took for granted not taking pictures of and stuff like But in memories, I always... Uh, remember those things. So it's kind of unfortunate that I don't, you know, but that's how life is sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> it is. All right, Bobby, anything else? Like no, I, I mean, it's fine. I enjoy talking about this because, like I say, uh, it's a, I keep saying this, fishing the older guys. I always go back to the older guys because... Uh, they can teach you a lot listening to them and 
without the older guys, we I probably or even the young guys now wouldn't know what fishing was all about, and they can uh, really can relate to you how it started. And I was told so many stories how fish used to be so plentiful that you can pretty much always almost walk on them, even right here in Beaufort. Mm -hmm. I was told those things when I was a little boy, and and how people depending on fishing to provide for their families. But things like that are changing now. They've changed a lot. And uh, just unfortunately, some of this stuff is pretty much dying out. You know? Yeah, so, so what does anybody do for work anymore? I really don't know because if you do something pretty much all your life, uh, it's kind of hard to, you know, to, to move to something, even though if you have to, because if this fades out, you fortunately yes, you have to do something. But when you do something pretty much all your life, it's hard to do something else, in a sense. So um, I think most of the guys probably do what they uh, do, what they can do to take care of their families. You know, cause I talk to a lot of guys now that's fishing down in Morris Point, and they're still fishing, and because the plants are still going. But if the plants ever give up, I guess these guys won't have jobs. But right now, a lot of these guys are still fishing. And are some of these guys from, from where you live in Right. A lot. What, where is your neighborhood in Moorhead about? I live right in Moorhead City. You right? Do? Yes, right on uh, Bay Street. Yeah, okay. Yes. And So you're really the first person I've talked to from Moorhead. I've been oh, talking really? mostly both for people. Okay. So that's interesting to me. So there's still some guys from Because here. really, a lot of it wasn't too many guys from Moorhead that really went fishing, as far as I know. You mean Beaufort or Moorhead? I would say Moorhead. Moorhead, Because yeah. it was a more, a lot of Beaufort people really went fishing. But I think a lot of guys from Moorhead, they, they, they really passed away, mm -hmm. you know. But I think most of it was more a lot of guys from Beaufort and other places, Bell Haven and stuff like that. Can you name some of the older fellas that you admired from your neighborhood that used to talk to you about the old ways of fishing? Hmm, it's, like I say, uh, a lot of those guys uh, uh, are gone. They're, they've passed away, I keep saying that. But I remember a man my brother used to talk about, his name was, he was from Beaufort. I'm sorry, he's not from Moya. His name was John Henry, and I remember this man. Well, he was an older man, but i never forget him, and he's passed away. And there was another guy that my brother, we were always, as a matter of fact, I talked to my brother about him today. I was trying to find out his real name. But they always called him Pumpkin. And I remember this as a little boy. But unfortunately, he got drowned. I never forget that. Because he would always come home with my brother after the season. But uh, this guy had got drowned, and I never knew his real name. Uh, a lot of all of these guys, like I say, you know, a lot of these guys are uh, they just they just passed away, you know. Oh yeah, and I bet some of these guys even maybe fished out of the factories when they were right there sure. in Moorhead. Yes. What was that? A Wallace factory in Quinn. I mean, that was before your time. Right, way before my time. Mm -hmm. You know, way before I my bet time. That, I bet they've worked out of the. Right, time. and I'm pretty sure some guys around there, but that can tell you more about them and. I think it's a guy named Ernest King. I know him well, but mm -hmm. he's living in the uh, Beaufort area. Ernest. I know Ernest. Right. Yep, I interviewed Ernest. He's real nice, oh, real, real nice. nice guy, and he can tell you a lot. As a matter of fact, I think him and some other guys, they were in the paper, I think, a couple of years ago, uh, talking about man named Fish and the times when the guys used to do the chanting and stuff like So they know more about it than I do. Yeah, so. oh, yeah, the older. <laughs> I'm just older. learning. <laughs> yeah, the house. older guys, they can tell you a lot oh, about yeah. it. And I'm pretty sure if you talk to him, he yeah. told you some some stuff. Right. Yes. All right, Bobby. Well, I appreciate you taking the time right before work here. Okay. You know, um, that's all my questions. Unless okay. you got anything else you want to no, add? No, it's fine. I really you got any enjoyed... stories you're dying to tell or anything? No. Okay. I pretty much said it all. And I keep going back for my brother. And I really mean this from the bottom of my heart. Uh he was a great guy. He was a great captain, and uh, I just miss him a lot, you know. But that's all I can say. When you want to honor somebody, even though they're not here, 
I mean, I, all I can just say is I appreciate him because uh, the things that I have, I could not have gotten them through without him for us hiring me to go to work, to take care of my family. Mm -hmm. And through him, I did all those things, mm -hmm. taking care of my family. And that's what it was all about, just going somewhere and making a living. So that's how I took it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, Bobby. Okay, Bobby.